Welcome to the Mill Valley Public Library. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I'm with the Mill Valley Historical Society in charge of the first Wednesday speaker series. I see many familiar faces, and I'm also in charge of the oral history program. And I thank you all for coming to the library on this beautiful summerish night. First, as always, the thing that the Historical Society likes to do is thank the Mill Valley Public Library for the use of this space to host our first Wednesday talks. It's, you know, I've had other people offer us the spaces to have their, these talks, and they just never measure up. No matter how swanky, no matter how accessible, it's just not the library. <laughs> so we are very grateful to be here tonight. And also, I want to thank all of our members. How many here are members? Yeah. Thank you for your support. Your membership helps the Historical Society do so many things, including these talks and the History Walk. Who attended the History Walk this year? Yeah. <laughs> and for those of you who aren't members yet, I urge you to become a member. The membership fee is so modest. It's, it's almost embarrassingly modest, but makes it so attainable. And once you join our historical society, you will get regular emails and news blasts and vignettes by Chuck Oldenburg. And they will inform you of historical facts and things such as the first Wednesday speaker series. And occasionally, you'll get a, a link to a really interesting oral history. We're going to try to do that more and more. Here's a little bit about the timing of the evening. Barry, our speaker tonight, Barry Spitz, will be speaking for about 50 minutes to an hour. And then we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A. And then afterwards, uh, Barry's going to be selling books. And that'll be the time that we ask you to help us fold up the chairs and put the room back into order. That's one of the ways that we show our appreciation for the use of this space. So thanks in advance for helping with that. Barry Spitz is the author of Mill Valley, The Early Years, Mount Tamalpais Trails, Marin, A History, and other local history and outdoor hiking books. I'm a hiker. Barry's, I have all of Barry's hiking books. They're staple in many ha households in Marin. The Dipsy, The Greatest Race, was published in 1993. And that's what he's going to be talking about tonight, but specifically women in the Dipsy race, which is a wonderful topic. Now, did anybody walk the 100-year? Uh, wasn't that the best? Yeah, that was unforgettable. I interviewed Barry in... 2015. And you can listen to that oral history, which is wonderful, if you just Google Barry Spitz, Mill Valley Public Library Oral History. And it'll come right up, and you can listen to it, or you can read it. And I learned a lot of things about Barry that I guess you just wouldn't find out if you, if you didn't reach in to, to listen. And I asked about his early affiliation with the Dipsy Race. And this was his response. And I'm it's kind of funny to speak for him, but this is a direct quote. Right, the Dipsy, of course, is the race of Mill Valley and Marin, the Bay Area, along with the Beta Breakers. But I had not been that involved with it. I don't know why. I've been trying to figure that out because I got involved in running in 73 or 74. As I said, I ran my first race in 74. But I don't know why it took me so long to get involved with the Dipsy. But in 1981, a guy named Keith Hastings, a Marin guy, asked me to help him bring water to. There was no official water station yet at the Cardiac, like they have now at the highest point. Anyway, he had a friend running, so I helped him take water from the Lone Tree Fountain, which was working then, and I saw the race. And the next year, I was asked to announce the race, because I had already had a reputation as a race announcer. So. Isn't that funny? Essentially, Barry Spitz, who's been the voice of the Dipsy Race for 38 years now, his first involvement was his water boy. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, remarkably, you know, he's never really run the race. 
because according to Barry, I'm a very terrible downhill runner, and the Dipsy really does have a very, very hairy downhill. And it even favors the people that are fearless on the downhill. So I had no particular desire to race the Dipsy. They do have what is called a practice Dipsy, the double Dipsy and the quadruple Dipsy, and I have run all of those. I have run three quadruple Dipsies, which is four crossings. Those were the longest races I've ever done by far. I once broke 61 minutes in the practice Dipsy. They don't have that anymore, but it's a regular Dipsy. And then I've done maybe 10 double Dipsies. And I've run the course a million times, but I've never run the race. In any case, Barry is in the Dipsy Hall of Fame, perhaps the only Hall of Famer who hasn't actually run the race. <laughs> Tonight, Barry will be talking about women of the Dipsy race, and I'm proud to say that my own family has, in the history of this race, added a little, um, a little something to the annals of the history of the race. And that is, in 1974, it was my sister, Barbara Schwartz, who was the first and Barry, I think, the only woman to run the Dipsy topless. <laughs> 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 yeah, so we're very proud. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Barry Spitz. Is this working? Yes, it is. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the 1981 incident, because I, I just went through the slideshow before you guys arrived, and I'm missing one one women's winner, and that was that year, 1981. Florianne Harp, a Mill Valley lady who lived on Laddie Lane um, and was a friend of Keith Hastings. I came up there, we gave water from that fountain, that TCC fountain to her, and that was my first Dipsy. So Florianne, I'm sorry you're not on the slideshow for some reason, but thank you, thank you so much. And she won handily that year. Okay, I'm going to start with a little trivia question. I just learned this today, why this talk is kind of appropriate. Something big, big happened 100 years ago exactly yesterday in related to this topic. Who knows what it is? Huge, huge in your lives. Nothing to do with running. The Senate, on June 4th, two th uh, 1919, by a vote of 56 to 25, uh, voted for the 19th Amendment. And then it went to the states, and it was passed one year later. Women were already voting in California, by the way. Um, but um, this guaranteed it as a, as a, a right uh, for all U.S. citizens. We're, we're all aware that women do not have equal opportunities in, in all fields. Um, I really got an education by reading this new book called These Truths by Jill Lepore. It's, it's very well regarded now. It's probably going to win a Pulitzer Prize. And it's about our Constitution. It said a lot of great things that really didn't apply to more than uh, maybe a quarter of the people, if that. Um, it certainly didn't apply to the blacks. It didn't apply to the Chinese. It didn't apply to the Native Americans. It didn't apply to the women. To women. And it's a wonderful book that talks about the evolution of, of rights uh, that were guaranteed in the Constitution, and I highly recommend it. Women were not allowed to run in the Olympic Games until 1928. Um, and they had two races, a 100 meters and an 800 meters. And I've seen the film of the 800 meters. Um, and a couple of women did kind of go to the ground after, as the men do t to this day. Uh, 800 meters is a grueling race. But the sight of that really bothered people. And I read a, a quote from the London Daily Mail 
saying this is women should not be doing endurance events because it will shorten their lives. Um, but 10 years before that, right here in Mill Valley, women were running the Dipsy course, the Dipsy trail. Um, and so there's real history here. We, we tend to associate women's uh, rights in running with a famous incident of Kathy Switzer at the Boston Marathon and I believe it was 1967 when she registered as Kay Switzer, wore a baggy sweatshirt and they didn't know she was a woman. And she got many miles into it when they finally found out and the race director tried to pull her out and tried to knock her, to pull her out. And her boyfriend knocked that guy down, J Jack Semple, and that made front page of the New York Times and really triggered a lot of things in the world of running. But Mill Valley was way ahead of that, way ahead of that, 50 years ahead of that. And one of my goals in working on the Dipsy books and is to credit these pioneers and what happened here in Mill Valley. And that's part of the story, this early women's hike. And then we'll continue with how 23 women have won the Dipsy outright uh, since women were allowed in officially in 1971. So we have to have a picture of Mount Tam. These slides were assembled by Kate Mayfield, who was a wonderful lady who just left the library, unfortunately, to move back with her family to the East Coast. So this is an important point. Women were not running races. They weren't allowed, but they were hiking. And they were hiking on Mount Tam. And there were a lot of them. Um, so there's an example. Um, I mean, the Dipsy Trail itself was so jammed they had uh, lemonade stations along them. And, and there's actually a remnant of it on the top of the third flight. Um, it was jammed. People were just hiking. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. And we can't have a talk about, about Marin without a, pay, a praise for William Kent. Uh, a great hero of mine. What we have in, Mil in Marin would not have been without him, more than anyone else, more than everyone else combined due to him. He once owned most of Mount Tamalpais, developed not one inch of it. His children developed Sea Drift and Kent Woodlands, but he didn't, do, he didn't develop any of it. He donated. Due to him, we have the Marin Municipal Water District. He was the principal landowner for that. Who, don't, who championed it, we would not have had Mount Tamalpais State Park. We certainly would not have had Muir Woods, which he personally donated, the first personal donation of a national monument to the United States. So now people are down on him in the, in the National Park Service, bugs the heck out of me, because he was in favor of the Chinese Exclusion Act which about 95% of Californians were in favor of as well. But people are saying he shouldn't have done that, so they don't want to honor him anymore. And that's, I don't know about that. Um, and of course, we have to have a mandatory picture of John Muir and the, the wonderful Gravity Railroad. And that, that's just a sweet picture of John Muir, who didn't, who um, can't, uh, when he Kent donated these woods to the national uh, to the United States, of course they wanted to name it Kent uh, for Kent, but he refused. He says, "I had I have five sons, and if they can't carry on my name, I don't want it." And so he insisted it be um, honor John Muir, who it turns out later they came to blows over Hetch Hetchy. But that's another wonderful long story. All right, so now we get to why we have the Dipsy in. William Kent built the Dipsy in on sea, what is now Sea Drift, way, at, way on the north end of the sand. They were going to build a railroad from the Mount Tamalpais Railroad at West Point on to uh, Bolinas. That never happened, but Kent thought they would. 
Um, so they built this Dipsy Inn. Um, the origin of the word Dipsy, um, I did not know when I wrote the book in 93, I updated it in 2010. And I did finally find a letter from Kent explaining it. It comes from a, a line in a poem by Rudyard Kipling, who was very popular at the time. He won the Nobel Prize in 1903. This was built in 1905. And um, to take, uh, it comes from deep sea. Anyhow, that's the origin of it. So these are men of the Olympic Club, which is the oldest athletic club in the United States. And they got the idea, they took the train from San, uh, the ferry from San Francisco, then the train, and they got off at Almonte and took the spur line right into downtown Mill Valley and then got on the crookedest railroad that went up to the top of the mountain. And while they were in Mill Valley, they, somebody got the idea, let's see who can get to the Dipsy Inn first. And two guys, Co uh, Boas and Coney, Boas from the prominent San Francisco, they're actually both prominent families, uh, Alphonse Coney uh, made a race of it. And they still argue who, who won. But anyhow, that was in 1904. And in 1905, the Olympic Club said, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's make a race of this. Uh, open a wall. And it was very complicated. This is before radios, before cars here in Marin. And to do a point-to-point -point race, very complicated. But the Olympic Club had a lot of influence, a lot of resources, and they pulled it off, even though it, it was complex. And actually, as my, as my wife Pam here would know, we try to get radio reports now on who's in the lead. Never works, never works. They had s uh, semaphores, people signaling with flags, and they knew. So in over 100 years, we've gone backwards. <laughs> so this is the start in 1912. It's always started in the same place. The finish is slightly changed in Stinson Beach, which used to be called Willow Camp. But basically, it's the same race. They used to let you go any which way you want. Now, they, since the park service start, came along in the 70s, that's not the case, but um, but um, this, I didn't even know was in there. Watch this. Enjoy this. This guy moves, Victor Ballesteros. No? Where do you see him move downhill? That's the part that impresses me. So there he is coming up. That's, he just passed the highest point on the course, cardiac. The good part's coming at least to me. This, this is an area that actually does not have a name. Every other part of the course has a name. All right, now he's heading, uh, he's about at mile five, and now he's heading on the swoop, and in a steep ravine. This is the hairy part. These are very dangerous. And you're passing people, because people are, start ahead of you, and they're passing you. And then these are two shortcuts on the highway that George Leonard, who used to own over a 1,000 acres, donated to the county of Marin in perpetuity. Right. Uh, oh, yes. I, uh, I don't know how they filmed this. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> He's the real hero. <laughs> this is the hairiest part right there. They have to jump over style. He did not do that. People go there and watch people cr get their jaw broken. So he's w they get award black shirts to the top 35. So he obviously won a 34 at some point. So it gives you a little feel. Of this is a very dangerous race. And uh, before I forget, Mr. Dipsy is actually sitting here. The officially, Mr. Dipsy, winner of the race, Don Ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, Don. So.
this is some stuff that came out after I first wrote the book. The guy on the left turns out to be the real hero behind the women's dipsy hikes, George James. He left a, a clippings file that a member of the Dipsy Committee has seen. He really believed in women and women's rights, and he made the race happen, the, uh, the hike happened in 1918 and ended in 1922. Turned out he died in 1922. So I think that he was, he was truly the, the reason behind it. This is just a great picture. I mean, just a great picture. I have to mention this. I'm getting a little, I can't see the clock, so I, I gotta move over. So for the 100th anniversary, I had the idea that we should duplicate the bib numbers, that that would be a, a really nice touch, because they were handmade in the old days. I asked some old English guys, they, used, they were of cloth, and they were hand done. So I have a, very, a daughter who's a very good artist, and I asked her to do it for a little bit of money. The Dipsy Committee agreed. Well, that turned out to be quite a project quite a project and uh, we didn't quite make it to 500 we had to bring in the cavalry but uh, anyhow that's the story of the bib numbers so some of you will recognize this all of you will recognize this because the Bank of America building's still there I have a pointer here I don't I have to, oh no I didn't want to do that so I'm not going to use the pointer but this, how many of you know about this? Between the renovatory and the dry goods, what is that? The significance. The train went through there. The train up Mount Tamalpais went through there. It's filled in now. Um, it just started right here and it went right across through there. That flagpole's still there, right? Is it the same flagpole? Honoring the first Mill Valley uh, person to die in World War I, although he, he never went to Europe. He died in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington of meningitis, Lytton Barber. Um, so a lot of people came to watch. The women's hikes uh, outdrew the men. Here's a picture of how they got there. As I said, they got off the main line at Almonte and took this under two miles to go to downtown. Now it's Miller Avenue. Mount Tam looks a little bit. West Peak, you know, was higher, was the highest of the peaks, and now it's leveled for the those for a dome. And now that I look at that, I wonder if that's what we're seeing, that why it looks a little different. Because West Peak was higher by about thirty feet than East Peak. And that's an interesting shot there. You don't, s you can't, that's not available now. And that's where they got off and it started and that's where you can buy your books and, well, it's closed now, isn't it? Temporarily, I think, right. for renovations. So there's a good headline, entry so numerous that the trail may be wide. Now, we don't know what the heck they were talking about there, but that's, that's the, but the women's hike did outdraw the men's significantly. The men started in 1905, the, but every year that the women's hikes were held, all five, they outdrew the men at least two or three to one. And here's the entry. I mean, the men never had more than 100 in those years. Here's well over 200, 300. And for the, for the 100th, I tried to contact the sponsors, and one or two of them are still in business. Only two, A.G. Spaulding and Company, they make gloves, and Wright and Ditson, never heard of them before, but they still are around making women's clothing. They did not respond, and the Gillette Safety Razor Company. So, But uh, some of the rules, professional hikers not eligible, <laughs> I wish that profession still went on. <laughs> uh, 
girls under 17 not permitted, no pacemakers, and so on. Um, these, uh, Kate threw in from her collection, just treasures, absolute treasures. I, I've never seen these before. I mean, to have one of those, wow. Um, this went on in the men's race, in all men's races, everywhere until around, I remember having one. Do you, any of you guys remember Wally Strauss? He was a Mill Valley doctor. He said, he used to do it at the Dipsy. You had to have a mandatory heart check at every race until around 1973 or four. And he said it was so cursory that he put the stethoscope on somebody's shoulder and he said, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> um, all right, now, this is proof. People ask me, including this lady, just called me from KALW radio yesterday. Did they really run? This is a picture. I know it's blurry, and that's why it's still in there. Both feet off the ground, blurring the picture. This is the winner of the first women's dipsy hike in 1918. Her daughter came to the wim to the centennial. This just blew my mind. Her daughter, who's 90 years old, Bobby Van Muir's, Liz and Ross, will outlive me for sure, sharp as a tack. And she came with her children and grandchildren. And it just shows the continuity of the dipsy and the dedication. Um, and they have this trophy. No, they don't have this trophy. They had this trophy. Edith donated it in World War II to a metal drive. They do not have that trophy, but they have that picture. This is a happy lady. Right, they were sponsored by the Olympic Club uh, as a swimming team, courtesy of the Van Muir's family. This just shows that this was popular. This is Willow Cam, Stinson Beach, Highway 1, Shoreline Highway. And they, they came out in droves to watch this. This was big. I'm trying to remember how. Oh, Emma Riemann. Emma Riemann. We have a picture of her. So it got big. That's big coverage. That's a, I forget the journalism name for when it runs across two pages like that. You don't see that very often. Um. Another picture of the start. Oh, uh, we could spend a lot of time on these buildings. Some of them are the same. Some of them are not the same. And the rents have gone up. <laughs> 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 this was donated by this gentleman right here, Phil Smith. Now, I don't remember who your relation is with This gentleman's aunt is in this picture. Number 12, I don't, 129 maybe? Right, oh, and then, the oh, <laughs> wow. Is this a great picture in there? Do you, I mean, this is the Dipsy. It just keeps, wow. Thank you for donating that picture, Phil. <laughs> now, where is this? Uh, we've had a lot of debate about this. Um, well, Right, it's somewhere above the stairs. Th that's always a safe thing to say. Uh, uh, but those trees are possibly still visible, I've been told. 
it may be where the houses are now, the flying Y. Um, we're on the way to the one mile mark, one mile tree, because they're so densely packed, I'm pretty sure it's real early. But uh, there are a lot of women in this event. Um, maybe. maybe. Well, they, they accompanied them. Right. They don't have bib numbers. <laughs> right. No pacemakers. Um, just another great picture. Just, I know w a lot of people for the hundredth wore headgear. Whatever happened to the hats for men and women? <laughs> oh, okay. And I invent I invested in a haberdashery years ago. Oh well. <laughs> and e Mill Valley's own Emma Riemann. Still haven't gotten to the bottom of her story. A, a guy sent me a long treatise on her. I'm not sure he had it right. She did live in Mill Valley. I know in her later life, she was the president of the Tamalpais Conservation Club for a couple of years. Um, she lived on Dots Lane. How many of you know where Dots Lane is? Whoa. Because I believe there, there was one house. Now I think there may be two houses on it. All right, her crew, I used to hang out with them, but they, they never set foot on a legal trail. So <laughs> that's another story. But Emma Riemann was my goal when I was doing the 93 book. I was trying to find as many people as I could, and I just missed her. She had died alone. No one knew about it. No one reported in a nursing home in the Central Valley. And I had even heard that they had t had to uh, kind of tie her down in her last years. Very sad story. But Emma Riemann, she's a charter member. I founded the Dipsy Hall of Fame. And we put five people in originally. Norman Bright, Jack Kirk, Timothy Fat Fitzpatrick, who founded the race, Sal Vasquez, the greatest racer, and Emma Riemann. Okay, now we've, we've just skipped uh, uh, 50, 40 years, so I want to fill you in on a little what happened. Women, after 1922, they said no more. So no woman, uh, they eliminated the 800 meters in the, in the Olympic Games. The, the 200 meters did not come in until 1964. The 400 meters, I think, was 68. I looked it up in the mor this morning. I don't know why it, it's not right in front. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, the 200 meters came in 1948. The 400 meters came in 1964. The 1500 meters in 1972. And the marathon in 84. So f for many years, women just not, not involved in this. Um, in 1950, the wife of the, of the 1941 men's winner, her name is Nancy Dreyer, she was a nurse, she ran it. And it was rep reported in the newspaper. She did it in 50, 51, two and three, and uh, 54. She lived in paradise, by the way. And I, I was gonna someday try to dig that up, but I missed the boat on that. Um, so then in 1952, Two, they had a one-mile race from Whitegate, the old dairy that's w about a mile from the finish line, to the finish for, for girls. Um, then in 1959, a lady named Adrienne Rieger, who ran the Pelican's Nest Restaurant in Stinson, which I don't know about, but maybe some of you old-timers know that. Um, then in 1963, three teenage girls ran. 1964, a lady named Donna Thurlby ran. 
1965, Thea Hogan ran and had a, one of the great lines I've ever heard. I was totally winded before I got to the stairs. <laughs> um, dog in Mill Valley and isn't, she's not up for it anymore. The, um, then the true pioneer, Elaine Pedersen, who I got to meet, um, Don knows her. Uh, there she is at the starting line in her tennis outfit. Um, they didn't want her in there and she was befriended by a guy named Pax Beale who made some wonderful Dipsy movies and an Olympic champion named George Roden. I don't know how he got involved, but he must have known Pax. He snuck her in a little bit after the start, and she started getting listed in the results. And after she died, her ashes were scattered on the Dipsy Trail. She died in 2000. Uh, Elaine Pedersen. Um, in 1968, I mentioned George Leonard, the man who bought a lot of Mount Tamalpais. Um, he donated that easement, and his daughter, Barbara Robin, who's still around, we got to know her, and uh, she's now run more Dipsies than any other woman over 40, and she's in the Hall of Fame. Um, 1969, women began racing for trophies. They still were not official. But they had trophies for them, and the first trophy was won by Vicki Eberly, who's, she was 14, and her 10-year-old brother actually won the race. And then in 1970, a lady named Mary Cortez won. Then, finally, 1971, women were allowed. The AAU, which ran the sport, said women can compete in races. And we couldn't find a picture of her running um, but this is, this is one of my heroes who I've yet to meet. I've talked on the phone. I invited her to come to the hike. She didn't do that. But this is a great lady. Um, she was a pioneer neurosurgeon, possibly the first female neurosurgeon in the United States, or one of the first. She felt she was very, she graduated from Stanford, she had deep Stanford roots, and became a doctor at Stanford, and felt she was being mistreated by the male fraternity there, and wrote this book. She quit and wrote this book, Walking Out on the Boys, and it was a bit of a cause celeb for a while. She also, well, anyhow, in 1971, the first year that women were allowed, she was the first woman official finisher of the Dipsy. She was fifth in the race and set the course record just over an hour. She also won the first Beta Breakers as a woman, uh, as an official female entrant that same, a couple of months earlier. And they, I knew about this picture, but this one was dug up. I had never seen this picture till tonight. Uh, chair of the neurosurgery department. Frances K. Conley. Her husband was the Olympic javelin thrower, Phil Conley. That's not her maiden name. Anyhow, this is somebody who uh, should be even more honored. This is just one of the great pictures. Th this is just from 1972, Debbie Rudolph. Um, Young girls were the stars of these early dipsies. And she was 11 years old. She finished second to a 10-year-old boy. But she led the race for a while. So this is the first woman ever, girl, female, to le actually lead the dipsy. That's her father. 
and the dogs. She came back. She, she ended up winning four Best Time Awards before she was 15. And then she disappeared from the Dipsy. But she came back, you may remember, 25 years later to run in it. Broke both her arms during the race. She finished, but she broke both her arms in a fall. Dipsy's a very dangerous race. And here is the first female winner, Marietta Boitano. She won the Beta Breakers three times before she was a teenager. When she was 10, she finished fourth in the first ever women's um, marathon, United States Marathon Championship. She, she first ran sh when she was five. In her interview about after the race, her main concern was being eaten by bears. She was 4'4", 66 pounds, I think I got it here, um, 60 pounds. And uh, she set the course record at, at this race, 58-43 uh, this year. So this is 1973. Her brother had won the two previous years. It was uh, only a year older. Here's the first adult winner in 1980, Donna Andrews. She was a native of Georgia. I knew, I got to know her, interviewed her. She was 39 at this time. Um, she was shown the course by Don Chafee, who didn't think he had anything to worry about. He was wrong about that. Um, she managed the Marathon Fitness Center in Sausalito. Anybody remember that one? Oh, wow. Wow, very good. Um, pardon? Yeah, and uh, she was inspired to run by the movie On the Edge. She ha That's not true. Uh, she was in On the Edge. Her scene running downhill is one of the highlights of that movie, the flying downhill. And a very sad ending, I guess. You were there with me. They showed On the Edge at the Rafael. It's a movie based on the Dipsy. I speak the last words in it, by the way. Greatest movie ever made. <laughs> um, and... They sh screened it in the Rafale, and she came with her family. They took they took a whole row with her family, and she died about three or four days later of cancer. I mean, she was very sick, but she wanted to come to that. Then 1981, the one I'm missing, Florian Harp. I told you that was the first uh, when I get, was a water boy and uh, started my career. 1986, Gail Ladage Scott, one of the top runners in the nation. And that's what it takes now to win the race. You know, I forgot to mention, how are women winning this race? Wh what's going on here? Ever since 1905, the race has been handicapped. Head starts given to runners. Um, so women... It's based on your age now, starting in 19... It used to be based just on your judgment of your ability, an assessment of your ability. But starting in 1965, it was based on your entirely on your age. And when women were allowed in 71, it was based on your age and your gender. So women do have a head start over men. Not, not over all the men. Older men start with the women, and it varies by the age of the women. But that's how women... They don't actually run the fastest time, but they're first to the finish line. And here's Gail LaDodge Scott winning in 86. And she once held the United States Masters over 40 marathon record. So she was a top runner, and that's what it takes now to win the race. You have to be one of the best runners in your age group in the nation. She was the one that was inspired by On the Edge. Here, the year later, very famous incident happened. This is Christy Patterson, who lives in Tiburon, and still very active, still runs the Dipsy. 
Gail Scott was in the lead in the year after she won. She won in 86. She was leading in 87 when she got to what is known as the top of the swoop. Instead of going down the swoop, which is really hairy, she went right, which is the Dipsy Trail, but it's way, way longer. And it's forever known as the Gail Scott Trail. And the, she, Gail Scott finished second, but she graciously said, that's not why I finished second, it's Christy outran me. Peggy Smythe was inducted into the Hall of Fame two years ago. In 1988, which I'll go into a little more, ran the fastest time ever by a female, and that still stands. 12, so that's uh, 31 years. Um, 55, 47, I think. Um, and she was two seconds ahead of uh, Patricia English, and those are the two fastest times ever recorded. And those are amazing times, and no, very few men record those times, very few. And no woman has really gotten very close. So 1989, lives right on West Plythdale. She did, I'm not sure she still does. Uh, Eve Pell, journalist holding the bear that they awarded. Um, she, she had a real back problem right before. This was a really great triumph for her. Um, and uh, she was 52. She had was the oldest woman at the time. That's been broken, though. Um, when her, she married again later, Sam Hirabayashi, and when he died, she raised money for a fountain that is at top of Cardiac Hill, and it's, they don't allow it to be named Sam's Fountain, but that's what most people call it. Uh, and you can get water there. Um. Oh my, Megan McGowan. Just a great picture. I got to know her a bit. She was a sensation, an absolute sensation when she came on the scene. She first ran at age eight. Um, then she led almost all the race in w at age nine in 1991 when she was finally passed by Sal Vasquez. Um, and then she came back in 92 at 10 and won. And then she won again in one of the greatest performances in 93. She had four fewer head start minutes, but still won again in 93. She was very much pushed by her stepfather. Um, and that story emerged later when I talked to her. I wrote a letter, a recommendation letter for her to get into West Point. And she did get into West Point and ran for the Army but she, she didn't finish, and then she disappeared, and we couldn't find her for the first reunion. But she is very happy now, uh, married with children, lives in Kansas, works at Kansas State. Her name is Megan Sawyer. And she told me how, how bitter she was that she w didn't have a childhood, how hard she was pushed, but she reconciled with her father before he died. And uh, and uh, a, a wonderful story. Um, so we hope to see her more. Then Shirley Matson, who was the greatest age runner in the nation, in the when she was in her fifties and sixties, she won four times the most of any woman. Um, starting the first in two thousand. And uh, also 2001, 2004, and the last one was at age 63. The first year that, in, uh, that she won, this year, I, I retain this guilty feeling. Second place was a lady named Gabriella Anderson. Does anybody remember her? 
Some of you remember her. She's the one that staggered around the track on the final in the Los Angeles Coliseum. I happen to have been there, the greatest sports moment I've ever witnessed, the first women's Olympic marathon, where for an hour and a half, everyone in the Coliseum, and there were 100,000 of us, just stood and clapped. And Gabrielle Anderson staggered around, and nobody thought she would make it to the finish line, but she did. But anyhow, she was second in this race, but she had never seen the course, and I, I was one of those that took her over, and I didn't show her the shortcuts, and she didn't take the shortcuts. There are legal shortcuts. She finished second. Oh, well. And this is a friend of ours, Melody Ann Schultz, maybe the greatest of all the wi women's dipsy runners. Um, she won three times. She many ways should have won five times. Twice she collapsed and was taken to the hospital while in a well in front of the field. Twice. Both times passed by Russ Kiernan, who went on to win. Um, but she won three times, and one of her wins I call one of the greatest, maybe the greatest of all the feats. Um, she ran at age 61, a time of 63 minutes. Now, running your age, I know it may sound weird, running your age is something that only, a, like if you're 50 years old and could run 50 minutes, that would be running your age. Very few men have done this. It's a very rare feat. For a woman to even, she missed by two minutes. It's just mind-boggling that she ran 63 minutes at age 61. Her margins of victory were b over five minutes. And this is supposed to be with the handicapping where you win by seconds. She won twice by over five minutes. We skipped. We're going to come back in chron chronology. I know this is a little out of order. That's Melody Second. This was in 2010. Mill Valley resident. Um, Riley Johnson, another one who, whose father had a, he was in the race, but they forgot to declare for the family trophy. They would have won the family trophy. Maybe the Hannafords won it instead. I don't know. Not that year. Um, she became the youngest winner by a few days, uh, resting the record away. And that's a really neat shot. Very late in the race. They, they all raced, they went back and forth. Maybe not back and forth, but very close. Very close. So this, there's only a tiny bit of running left. And youth prevailed. Oh, didn't mean to. I'm not sure. All right. We just had lunch, dinner with Jamie Burns. Um, she won twice. And is still the happiest lady around. Um, she was known as Jamie Burns, now she's Jamie Rivers, cause her, and she's married to Roy Rivers, who I believe that's the guy pouring the, who's got the cup over it. He's also a winner of the race. She also won the double dipsy that year, and she was also first woman in the quadruple dipsy, the first one ever to have all those titles. And on the left is Russ Kiernan, another Mill Valley legend who has the most um, black shirts of anybody. And she's running in the race now. Well, she has, women hit their maximum head start at age 66. And she's now 68, so she's a little bummed out. She doesn't get any extra minutes, so her chances are, are, are gone now of any further wins. If you, did, how many saw the IJ today? She was in there. A feature on Chris Lundy, another one of the, she's one of the, top open runners. I know everybody, I'm not supposed to be, f can't say anything about her midriff, right? Okay. So she's one of the top open runners of all that have ever run the race. She's a, a United States mountain running champion. It's the best mountain runner in the United States. She, she's won that title a few times. Lives in Sausalito, a veterinarian, uh, went to Penn. She's won it twice. She's won uh, the last two years. 
And she's also had the fastest time of any woman seven times. Um, so she will have a shot at winning and winning that eighth title on Sunday, this Sunday. Make sure you're out there, 8.30, first runners leave from Old Mill Park. And here's the race director. Women have, somebody said, you said, Debbie, that the first one not to run the race. No, we honor the officials. And Etta does run the race. She's been the race director for many, many years and has done a wonderful job, Etta Stickle. And she'll probably run one more time. She's in her 70, she's 76 now or 77. Um, right, so we were a little out of order. Diana, not really. Diana Fitzpatrick of Larkspur won twice. This is coming off that really hairy business there. And there's a picture in my early edition of the book of a woman coming over there, falling, hitting her jaw. It won the, it won the California prizes one of the best sports photos of the year. And I've talked to that lady. She's still undergoing uh, reconstructive work on a jaw uh, many years later. But Diana made it and made it well. And she did one of the greatest of all feats, not in the Dipsy, in the Western States 100. At age 60, the, wo the one Western States 100 is 100 miles, goes over the crest of the Sierra. Absolutely brutal. She broke 24 hours, which is the gold standard to win what they really aim for. She became the oldest woman by far ever to do that. And that was last year or a year before. Fabulous achievement. And then I organized the 75th anniversary of the first woman's hike. And two survivors came. Two survivors came. Um, they brought their trophies. That was a magical, magical moment. Right, this is right in uh, Linton Square, right on the benches there. Even that bench is still there, just as, just like that. And one of them lived to 103 as the last survivor of the women's hikes. <sighs> That's a picture from s from that year. Um, we had a run. We ran. They were. We ran over the course in honor of. I don't know if the clock is working then or not. <laughs> would, it would be a rarity. So here's the celebration we had this year. This is the. Let us now praise the bib numbers, all right? That, that's the highlight of this picture, those bib numbers. That was a very, it, we had beautiful weather and it was non-competitive. No results were recorded, no times were taken. We had fun, we had fun that day. What? It was limited to 250. Well, we didn't record them, but there was something in that range, maybe even a little more. And again, those are just beautiful bib numbers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so people came with their families. I think that might be it. Oh, one more. Marietta Boitano, who you saw win at age eight or nine earlier. She got bib number one, and that's, I believe, her grandmother. Yeah, well, her mother. I don't know about that. <laughs> that's her mom, right? She was a pioneer. They, the whole family ran together in the 60s and 70s. And there's the Hickman family, now the Van Muir's family, with that famous photo. That's the 90-year-old daughter in the middle. And that's her daughter, and that's her granddaughter. I know. 
she's going to outlive me by at least 10 years. And that is the end of the show. So we have a few minutes, and I mean a few, but I'd like to hear some questions. Okay. And after I'll sign, I brought some Mill Valleys, some Tamil Pius Trails, and some Dipsy books, which I'll be happy to sign. I have it written down. Kay Willoughby, correct. Not Kay Willoughby, who passed away not too long ago herself. Horrible, horrible. Last year. Sorry. Kay Willoughby is omitted. Another winner. Sorry. We didn't have a picture of her. I have one in the book, though. I don't know how that slipped through the cracks. Thanks, Tim, who put the slideshow, helped put the slideshow together. Thanks, Tim. Right. I wanted her. To, the question is how uh, the story of the black shirts and which woman has the most. They started putting shirts on the finishers because they couldn't keep track of them. So they put a numbered shirt on them. And they did that for 25 originally. And then s somehow they got a deal on three dozen. So they. Uh, so they started giving out 35 and gave the other one to one of the race directors. Um, and that has become the thing to get a black shirt. I mean, of course you'd like to win, but uh, getting a black shirt is really, really. And Debbie has how many? Just two. Just two. Don's got about ten. Um, the Russ Kiernan has thirty-four. But the top woman is Jamie Burns, who we uh, had dinner with. I think she's got about eighteen or nineteen. Um, any other questions, I hope? Come on. Okay, well, thank you. Well, there's one. Well, a lady named Rita Liberti wrote a, a treatise, a treatise, her PhD thesis on this subject, L-I-B-E-R-T-I. She's a teacher in Hayward. You could look up, you could read that, like liberty with an I. Um, well, in, in Boston, I told you they tried to pull her out. I mean, they just didn't accept your entry. Um, I don't know whether in rinky-dink races anywhere, whether women were maybe participating, but uh, they were not allowed. If you had a woman in your race, your race was not sanctioned. It was considered a non-race, and it wouldn't be sanctioned the next year. And they were strict about it. And it took till 1971 for that to change. Charlie. Right. Um, it's called a deep sea chanty, C-H-A-N-T-E-Y. And I know the line, but I don't have it memorized. It's, it's in the latest book. I'll look it up. Raise a glass for a deep sea something. So it's not deep sea, but a deep sea. And, uh, you know, people always thought it was named because you take a dip in the sea. Or the trail looks like it's dipping into the sea when you see it from uh, above. But that's what Kent said, and he's the guy that named it. So, okay, well, thank you. Oh, wait, wait, two more, and then we got to go. One and then two. Right. Well, we've talked to Melody about that. 
she's hedged that. She thought there may have been a chance she could have passed at one point on the swoop. But one year, Megan McGowan was paced, that little one, and that created an uproar. It was a, a approved in advance, but now they don't allow that anymore. She was not by her father, but by an, a recruited runner, and it was a big outroar, uproar, and they didn't, it's no longer allowed, no more pacing. I've read that. And uh, who knows? Melody has uh, eight grandchildren now, <laughs> so <laughs> so she's. But of course, she started a little after. And one more from Mr. Dipsy. I know I I didn't have a picture of her. Margaret was a lovely, wo lovely woman who lived in Mill Valley and is no longer with us. Thank you. Thank you very. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, next month on July 3rd, we have Brian Crawford, who's going to be talking about shipwrecks of Marin.